Thank you everyone for joining us today for this town hall on maintaining emotional well-being during and after COVID-19. A couple of things before we jump in. Um, you are in listen only mode today. Everyone is muted to prevent audio feedback and any echo. We welcome your questions. So please uh, click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen to ask a question. And only the preventers will see your questions. did get questions submitted beforehand, so we'll, we will be addressing those and we'll take live questions in the second half of the webinar. And you are encouraged, if you like, to submit a question anonymously. Um, when you do submit the question, you will see the option to click for that. The session today is being recorded and it will be posted to our website for anyone who may have missed it or if you'd like to watch it back again. And one note, please don't share any personal um, medical information or questions. If you have a medical question, ask your doctor. And I would like to introduce our speakers today. Dr. Jeffrey Peppercorn is a medical oncologist specializing in breast cancer. He is an associate professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, and the director of supportive care and survivorship at Mass General Cancer Center. Dr. Joseph Greer is a clinical psychologist specializing in supportive cancer care. He is the associate professor of psychology at Harvard Medical School and the program director for the Center for Psychiatric Oncology and Behavioral Sciences at Mass General Cancer Center. I'll turn it over to you now. Great, uh, thanks very much, Devin. So Joe, before we um, get to some of the information specifically about our patients coping um, and their healthcare during COVID, um, I think one thing about this pandemic is we really are all in this together. Um, and I thought it might be interesting to start with, you can just share with us, I know my life and schedule have changed so how has your work and your life changed? What are you doing to take care of yourself during this time? Um, our patients are <clears throat> Right, no, I think, I think it's an important question and a great way to start. You know, I, uh, you know as, as Devin mentioned, I'm a clinical psychologist. I work within the cancer center. Um, so part of my, my position is to work with people diagnosed with cancer, sort of at any stage along that trajectory, uh, in, a doing, in addition to doing research on supportive care interventions to assist patients and families coping with cancer. And, you know, since the onset of, of the COVID pandemic here in the United States, my practice has really transitioned entirely to virtual care at this point. Um, and so I've been providing psychotherapy over the virtual integrated Zoom system, much like we're using today, uh, for people who are experiencing stress or anxiety or depression or any number of psychological concerns. Um, during this period, not simply due to COVID, but just because of all the cancer experiences that people and stressors people are, are, are undergoing. And, and you know, as in my, my division in psychiatry have been a bit ahead of the game in, in using telehealth. And I would say coming into this pandemic, about a quarter of my practice was over, over telehealth, but now 100% is. And, wow. and so I have to say, it's, it's been a real shift in my care and in my in my daily life. Um, there's now a permanent depression on this end of my couch for where I do all my Zoom meetings and therapies. Um, but I have to be very conscious of making sure I have a separate space for work um, that's both private and, and secure, but also even psychologically gives me a bit of a buffer to then leave <laughs> so that I still have some sort of respite in my home area. Um, and so what, some ways that I try to do that it's frankly, just try to take breaks, you know, every hour or so to go into a separate space. In the evenings, I've really prioritized taking walks outside um, because I really need to kind of just decompress from the day, especially from sitting so much in front of a camera. Um, and I've really had to shift some of my lifestyle. So for example, I used to go to a gym regularly and because of COVID, I'm not able to do that. So I've switched to Zoom meetings with a personal trainer, um, which I do out of my bedroom, you know, so a lot of just sort of modifications to the things that normally, you know, I took for granted, frankly. Um, but I have to really prioritize them. Initially, I had let go of, say, the exercise, but then I realized after a couple of weeks, I need that as a mainstay to manage stress. So, so like all of you who are, you know, watching this webinar, I think we're all kind of figuring it out as we go along. Um, but at least I can hopefully share some of the collective wisdom I've gleaned from talking with people and trying to support them uh, through this critical period. 
and certainly the things that I've taken in to help make my life a little bit better under this amount, you know, immense stress. Great. That, I mean, that alone sounds like great advice. I know there have been a number of papers published. It's no surprise to me as a clinician about the stress levels. I mean, frankly, talking to my friends and neighbors, um, there's high stress levels. So it is certainly not unique to people who are coping with cancer. But there have been studies showing that it can be even harder on patients with cancer and their family members and caregivers, um, particularly if the disease is active, but, but also for people who are years from therapy. So can you talk uh, you know, uh, with your professional hat um, how people can cope with the challenges and stress that they're facing during this time? Yeah, so I, I first want to just acknowledge that the people experiencing stress and anxiety dur during this time is truly a normal reaction that I think that for a lot of people, they're wondering, you know, is, is the worry I'm experiencing or this discomfort I'm experiencing, this distress, is it off or am I, am I not coping effectively? And, and I've been trying to reassure, especially the patients with whom I work, that you're having a normal reaction to an abnormal situation. This is, this is truly, I know people have been saying it, and, and not to be cliche, but this is unprecedented. For most of us who are on this call, we have not experienced a pandemic in the United States of this fashion. And, and so the fact that people are experiencing distress, I first and foremost just want to say that's a normal reaction to this very scary time. So, so what I will also acknowledge is that stress can sort of show up in people's experience in different ways. There's ways that stress shows up in our thoughts. And for most of us, that's worry. Worry about what's going to happen next. And will we get a vaccine? And will I get this virus? So there's the thought process that goes along with the stress. In addition to that, some people may feel stress in their bodies, and the way that that manifests is sometimes people will feel a lot of muscle tension, perhaps they'll get headaches, uh, difficulty sleeping, maybe their heart will race and have some palpitations. These are all very common responses in our body to that stress, not to mention the emotional aspect of just feeling uncomfortable. And then lastly, it shows up in our behaviors, and the way that manifests is that many of us, because we feel so inundated um, by this stress, we may try to avoid triggers of it. So perhaps we're turning off the news or perhaps we're obsessively watching the news. <laughs> it can kind of go both ways. We may avoid the trigger or we may obsessively seek out information to try to calm ourselves, which unfortunately I think sometimes just makes us more stressed. And so, so there are some, some different ways that people will respond to that. As I mentioned, you know, I, I try to use exercise. Walking is a way to decompress. That's one of the coping behaviors, uh, some of the coping behaviors I'm using. Um, but, but the coping behaviors can be quite diverse. And so, so I will go through some of those that I think you know, may be useful for you to try to integrate into your life. And you'll see they kind of map on to the different domains that I just mentioned. Some might be more directed towards our thought process and worries. Some might be more directed towards calming the body and others will be more about adaptive behaviors. So you know, I would say first and foremost, now more than ever, I think we want to try to maintain our normal routines to the extent possible, meaning try to keep our morning wake times and bedtimes as consistent as possible. And we, you know, be mindful of our eating and nutrition and our exercise and particularly substance use. You know, in talking with people, I've definitely been hearing a lot of increase around alcohol use and other substances because for some that is a, that is a coping mechanism to help manage this time. And, and, and while that's understandable, the risk is, is that, that that continues to escalate. So if anybody is struggling with that, please know that there is support and help, and we can, and, and, and especially at MGH, even through virtual methods to help around uh, increased substance use if that becomes a problem for people. But I really do want to just say maintaining the normal routines really is key. I, you know, we're living a bit in Groundhog Day, where every day is sort of like another day of being home and isolated. Um, but as I talk to people, I just try to encourage them, like, try to keep your meals, you know, spaced as you normally would, uh, and be planful about that. Try to be mindful of how much news you're watching right before going to bed, and, and try to not have your phone with you or your iPad while you're in bed reading news before sleep, because it, for many people, they're just staying up till midnight, 1 a.m., just reading article after article after article, especially with all the, the social events happening as well. So I'd say that's first and foremost. But after we're trying to work on those health style routines, I think what I try to work with people and think about is kind of what's in our control and what's not, mm -hmm. especially now. Um, there are things that are in our control to help protect ourselves. 
And then there's just aspects of this pandemic that are bigger than us, um, that do have a degree of uncertainty that we don't have control over. So for the things, the concerns we do have control over, I wanna think through what's an action plan that I can, that I can implement to, to take a good course of steps to address my concerns. So if I'm trying to make sure I protect myself, well, the actions I can take are things like good hand hygiene, as we've all heard, wearing masks in public, making sure that we keep socially distant at least six feet or more when we're in public as well. Those are things in my control, right? Um, talking to my doctor when I have questions, that's in my control. Making sure I get my follow-up cancer care and surveillance, that's in my control. However, there are a lot of things that are not and that keep us up at night. You know, what happens if a loved one were to get sick or what happens if I were to get sick? Those kinds of concerns and how long would this last for? These kinds of concerns, you know, they're no, nonetheless pressing for us, but they don't have an easy answer to say, I need to take these steps to fix those worries. When, we, when we're faced with those kinds of stressors and we're, we're, we're finding ourselves just worrying, I think the shift is now to try to use coping strategies that help us just alleviate some of the distress in the moment. Um, and that can be anything from say, maybe using a relaxation or mindfulness app on a phone, listening to someone guide you through a simple relaxation or breathing strategy to calm the mind and the body using distraction. I mean, I've been watching more Netflix now for various shows and doing a bit of what, you know, binge watching on, on some shows that I've been interested in, but that distraction has definitely been a helpful kind of relief to get out of the moment. Journaling is also useful, taking walks, as I mentioned. I mean, I even have some people tell me they're watching zoo cams. I didn't even know this was a thing, but apparently it is. Like there are different things, different zoos who have opened up cameras to watch the animals in the zoos. And so, even that can just sort of turn our brain off for a little bit and help alleviate some of the stress of the moment because that will shift. <clears throat> we just need to get through that 10 to 15 minutes of intense distress by using some strategy to help shift our experience a little bit. But it doesn't, as I said before, it's, it's for those types of moments where we can't easily get to a solution. So helping to divide out what's in my control, take action for what things that are not in my control, try to self-soothe and to alleviate my distress uh, with a simple strategy that I just mentioned. I think the other key thing, and this is I think one of the hardest parts about this pandemic, is about social support. And normally when we are stressed, we would go to the people we trust to talk to them and to enlist their help. And unfortunately right now, that is much more difficult because of the pandemic. And it doesn't mean we're completely disconnected, and I've been really heartened to hear the ways that people are staying connected to their loved ones, both virtually, and now that the weather is getting better, um, doing some outdoor events where they're able to stay socially distanced. Um, and I, I think what we want to be thoughtful about when it comes to support from others is that um, there's different forms of support. Some forms of support are more practical. You know, I think for many people who've been diagnosed with cancer, they're very aware of practical support because their loved ones have offered to make them meals or, or take them to a doctor's appointment or to the infusion suite, things like that. Those practical forms of support are always, always great. Um, but that's one form. Another form is emotional support where somebody can really hear about your experience and empathize with that. Um, <clears throat> and, and some people have that skill to be in an empathetic ear and others, not so much. Maybe they're really better at the practical. And then lastly, there's what's called informational support. And I think the cancer care team is one form of informational support. In fact, the webinar we're doing today is another example of that. It's basically giving helpful education to support people to know what to do when they are experiencing any new um, phase of either their treatment or new stressor like what we're experiencing now. So, so I ask people when I talk to them, what are your support needs? What are the practical needs? What are the emotional needs? And what are your informational needs? And then let's try to line up the supports that match those needs most effectively. Because your best friend may be really, really great at driving you to the cancer center, but not so great in sharing about your experience about how hard it's been having cancer. And that, that means we wanna go to the right people for the right types of support. And then lastly, I'll just say, one of the things that we should anticipate is that 
over the course of this pandemic, we'll see sort of ebbs and flows and there'll be peaks in different parts of the country and, and others. You know, we're in a state that takes this very seriously and we've been seeing the numbers decline. All of that is very encouraging, but we are going to have to continue to cope with the stress of this for many months to come. And hopefully that will end sooner than later. But I just, I want to again normalize the realities of this for people and also to acknowledge that, that there will be points when your anxiety will peak again and then it will subside and peak again and subside. That's very normal. There may be moments when it feels like the peak is so high that it's causing you a, a great deal of distress where you feel like you may need some extra support because you're just having a hard time functioning. Like you can't get through the day. You're really not sleeping well. It's, it's really, really hard to concentrate. Again, that happens for a subset of people where the degree of distress really interferes with their functioning. Um, when that happens, that's a time you wanna reach out to people like me at the Cancer Center, the psychologists and the social workers and the psychiatrists, because we're specialized working in, with people who have been diagnosed with cancer um, to help them cope with those stressors. Um, although now it's more compounded because of the COVID-19, I do want you to be aware that we are here to support you. So, so those are just a sort of range of different coping strategies to start with. We'll obviously talk more as the webinar continues. Um, to just think about how to, how to manage the multiple understandable stressors that people are experiencing right now. It looks like Dr. Peppercorn might have had a technological difficulty, so hopefully he'll be able to log in in a second. Here he goes, he's coming back. One of the other questions that had come up uh, for people was, you know, how to communicate with like say a spouse who does not quite understand anxiety or feels vulnerable and you know the feelings of vulnerability that go along with cancer survivorship and i have to say i hear a lot about this from people just the, the difficulties in communication not just with say a spouse but maybe kids or or friends or other loved ones and and it's tricky and it's tricky now in COVID in particular because people are have uh different thresholds of anxiety around this pandemic. Um, and so when I, when I talk through communication strategies with people, there's a certain heuristic I use to try to promote effective communication. It's called the three Fs, um, and I'll go through what each F means. I will say this is not a guarantee that the communication is gonna work smoothly, but it, at least it's, a, it's an approach to communication that does help people move from a defensive, place to a more open conversational place. And so, so let me go through the three Fs and I can sort of share with you how you might apply it. The first F is a, a statement of fact. Um, that is a statement where you really want it to be objective as much as possible. Um, we'll use like a really benign example of like a frustration between you and the spouse about the fact that dishes are piling up in the sink, which seems to be happening a lot more during the COVID pandemic. So, now that's a fact. We both could walk into the kitchen. We can see that the dishes are piled up in the sink. The second statement is a statement of feeling. And this is where you basically just express how you feel about that fact. So when I walk in and see all the dishes piled up, I feel overwhelmed or I feel stressed out. So first the facts, then the feeling. The third statement is a fair request. And the fair request is basically getting a compromise from the other person where you're talking with them to say, look, I don't know if I can keep living with all this, you know, piled up stuff in the kitchen. Is there a way that we could set up a calendar about who does it on which days? You're really trying to hash out a behavioral plan. That's a fair request for the other person. Fair requests are behavioral and they tend to be compromises. They are not about asking a person to change their political beliefs or other value systems or things like that. It is about behaviors. So, so we want to be judicious again about when we use that communication strategy. Um, I tend to think about if it's going to be a hard conversation to really write it out, to think about how I'm going to say it before going into the conversation. And I also recommend people to give fair warning to the other person, say, hey, I would like to talk to you about something. When's a good time to talk? So they don't feel blindsided by a conversation. All of those things help make the conversation, particularly if, particularly if it's about a conflict, go a bit better. Uh, and then when you're ready, go into the three Fs. I will say it doesn't always work. But the goal here is to try to make that conversation be as successful as possible. So, so combining both best communication strategies like the heuristic I just shared with 
thinking about what is the outcome I can expect from this person, recognizing that this person may just not be the best at emotional support. Maybe they're better at, at you know, practical support. So sort of just being clear about what, it, what I can expect from this person and what is a fair compromise for what they can offer. And, and again, this is another place where we in the Cancer Center, whether it's the social workers who embedded in the clinic or people like me who are psychologists, we really role play this with the patients that we work with. We sort of hash out what the reasonable expectations are for those communications. Um, and we're here to, to help you do that. You lost me for a little bit there, guys. I don't know if you could tell my Zoom crashed. And, and it, for unclear reasons, act of God, it came back. You can hear me okay? You're good. Thanks for, thanks for getting back like, in. Yeah. It sounds like you started joining, uh, you started addressing some of the questions we got sent in. Am I, yeah, exactly. So I don't know if you hit this one already, but I think the other one uh, we had talked about was somebody who sounds like a uh, medical professional um, who said that uh, they were worried that they're, um, they're interested in their medical colleagues who are writing about how proud they are to have served during COVID and there's all that, but they're personally, because of their health history, worried about their risk and they're actually feeling guilty about not rushing into the breach as they put it. And I, and I know, and I thought I would share that we've had these internal MGH um, town halls with our nurses, physicians, uh, many other people um, who are involved in patient care. Many people expressed the same concerns, whether they were serving or not. This idea of feeling guilty about protecting yourself. They shared that they're a nine year cancer survivor and you know they didn't want this virus to be what took them out. So, so do you have advice for for this individual, as well as others like them, who may be feeling guilty, whether they're a healthcare professional or delivery person or you know, working on the front line in some way? No, I, I think it's such an important question. I, 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 like you, Jeff, I've been hearing a lot of echoes of that in my colleagues and in, in, in the people with whom I work. And the fact is, is that that stems from a really um, a beautiful place of empathy, right? Like the reason we feel guilty is because we feel profound empathy towards others in terms of wanting both to take care of others and also take care of our colleagues. And, and so I would like to just acknowledge that the source of that comes from a very good place. When we talk about guilt, you know, I really do want to differentiate healthy guilt from sort of unhealthy guilt because healthy guilt is the response to making some sort of harm or infraction for which we need to make amends, right? That's, that's a really good use of guilt. <laughs> uh, I accidentally or you know, intentionally harmed another, another on some level, or I, I screwed up somehow, and I clearly need to make amends. I, you know, I would say when you think about how much people feel guilty, that kind of healthy guilt is truly the minority. Most guilt that people feel is kind of a self-imposed um, guilt about how people believe they ought to be or should be. Um, sometimes that's societally imposed, sometimes it's internally imposed. That guilt really doesn't serve a helpful function. In fact, it's, it's more just weighs us down in terms of our anxiety and depression. And what I like to try to tell people is we can't be all things to all people, that we have to find what our role is in any moment. And so <clears throat> there are gonna be some people in this pandemic who are going to be in the front lines um, because they have the capacity and they are ready to do it and perhaps their risk is lower and they're going to be in that space. Now, so I am very, very grateful for those people and, and, and I can have a, a great deal of admiration and support for those individuals. I am not one of those people either, but it doesn't discount the fact that I can also help in this pandemic. I just need to find a way that I can help and that can be tempered with also taking care of myself. Understandably, there are a lot of people who are going through treatment, who are immune compromised, uh, or who have had serious complications post um, either surgeries or other issues through cancer that do make them more vulnerable. They do have to take an extra level of care in protecting themselves. That is reasonable, that's healthy, that's adaptive. And I really wanna reinforce that. It also means we can think about other creative ways to be supportive. Some people will do that financially. Some people will do that emotionally or other practical ways. I've had people tell me about how the organizations are supporting. Um, some people have donated masks. Like people have done a bunch of different things, but it doesn't all have to look the same. And I think it's the way we get through this together is by valuing our contributions to helping this uh, very stressful time. So think about who you are, where you are, understand the need to protect yourself. Think about the ways you can contribute while protecting yourself 
and then appreciate those who are on the front lines. Um, that's the way I look at this. Great, thank you. Uh, I'm a little bit nervous. A, a lot of the questions we got are sort of in the medical frame and things like, is it safe to come back to the hospital? Which um, we, I, I'm prepared to address. And we talked about um, spinning our, our moderator and discussant chairs. Um, I'm a little nervous because of the apparent instability uh, of my computer. I never know if that means a child upstairs is logging on to an exercise video or what is going on in my house, but we will do the best we can. Um, so thanks, thanks, Joe. Really, yeah. really helpful advice. Um, so, I mean, not to turn the tables on you, but how have you been coping and how's life been different for you during this time? Well, I don't usually have Zoom meetings and then have everything cut out on me in the middle. That, that was never part of my life. Um, and it's, it seems to happen, uh, the more, greater the importance of the meeting, the more likely Zoom will decide to do something funny to me um, or a dog will bark or whatever. But um, yeah, life is, life is okay, but it is very different. Um, I do have three teenagers now in the house. That alone is a challenge. I think there's probably some out there who um, have sympathy for me on that. They're all doing great, but um, you know, a daughter who is a freshman in college, literally living the dream, who's now trapped home with her parents, I mean, that alone uh, is, is a sort of unprecedented, uh, interesting, and, and not just living at home, that's, that's great, but can't see your friends normally, can't do any of the other things that a healthy teenager is usually doing. So that's been a challenge. Similar to you, we're trying to take care of our, our mental health and our physical health by getting out. You know, we'll wear masks when we go out. Um, if my wife and I are walking, you know, with nobody in sight, we'll take our masks off. If people come by, we put them on. I view it as uh, good for us, common courtesy, you know, the, really the least we can do to help protect others and, and a smart thing to do based on the evidence. Um, we'll go walking with my parents who are in their 70s and we'll all wear masks and just keep them on the whole time to obviously um, protect them. Uh, we're, we're cooking a lot more, uh, which has been good. My 19 year old daughter is taking a cooking class online, which has been fantastic. Um, and uh, you know, I've been going to the grocery store consistently, but we'll just be careful, wear a mask, plan it out, cleaning our stuff. I mean, I think these are not, it's not the most evidence-based, but I think it's good practice. You take the, perishable, uh, the perishables, you clean them, Stuff you don't need immediately, you can put aside for a couple days. Um, after a couple days, we, we certainly, I mean, the virus may not be transmitted that way at all, I wanna say that. But when they've done studies of how long does it last on surfaces, the longest we've seen as the viral load starts to go down is sort of three days on plastic. So beyond three days, everything should be safe. And whether it's really viable, even you know, at day two is, is unclear. But if you wanna be maximally protective without a big impact on your life, putting stuff aside for a couple days is reasonable. Um, so that's, that's in, in, in work, uh, I would say, you know, medical oncology and hematology oncology has been among the fields that really has not stopped seeing patients more than any others in person, because people who need either some part of their exam or um, chemotherapy, uh, other treatments are still coming in, but at least half my practice, maybe more, two thirds has been virtual which much of the time I enjoy because it, I'm happy to spare people uh, sometimes an hour drive coming in. Um, so I think some of that will, will stay part of what we do in the future when it's appropriate. Um, but I've had also, in, increasingly now we're having more patients come in for various things that at the height of it, we were trying to avoid. Um, we feel it's safe now. And I have to say it's very different and it's, it's nice for some situations to be able to see somebody in person. I think the patients feel that and we feel that. So we'll be well, looking to, to ramp that up. To pick on that point, pick up on that point, you know, one that, that it does pertain to one of the questions that came in. And also I, I do hear this from the people I talk to as well, going into the hospital. There's a lot of fear going in for appointments, but then when people finally do, they feel actually a lot calmer um, yeah. once they yeah. get there. Do you want to speak to what it's like for people coming in for appointments and their fears around that? Yeah, I don't know if, how many of the people listening have even been into uh, MGH or any of our satellite clinics since this started. Um, it has evolved since the first weeks in, in March and even early April. Um, the short answer is it's safe, or certainly it's as safe as any human contact between two individuals can be. Um, you basically cannot get into the building without a mask. There's hand sanitizer as you come in and everywhere. Um, all, everyone who works there, we are all having to certify every single day. You've got an app you have to fill out that says, you know, do you have any of these symptoms? Are you sick? And if, you're, if you are even having symptoms, forget having COVID, symptoms of anything basically, 
we're not going to work. Whether you're a medical assistant, physician, nurse practitioner, you're, you're not going in. And I have to show them my app to show them I'm healthy um, every time I go in. So I think, so A, it's safe to go back to the hospital, so to speak. Some people never stopped. Um, inside, it's the same kind of system. Social distancing is enforced. One double-edged thing is um, lack of visitors, um, which is worth touching on. So the general policy, as has been true of all healthcare for a while now since this started, is, is not to have visitors with you, which, which can be hard. I mean, with many diagnoses, in pediatrics, it can be incredibly hard, um, certainly in oncology. There are uh, in, um, immediate exceptions to this if the person has any disabilities or needs someone to help them there. Even I've had patients with extreme anxiety, um, and that has been okay as a reason to have your uh, partner there or caregiver with you. So if you have any concerns about this policy and you think you've got exceptional circumstances, either what's going on during that visit or your own medical condition, it can be that other visits you're okay, but this time you need somebody, um, you should be sure to talk to the care team. And when at all reasonable, we're able to make exceptions. Um, that was part of your, I don't know if I veered off from your question. No, that definitely addresses, you know, what people can expect coming into the hospital. Are all operations, say like mammograms and clinical trials and things like that operating and, and what, you know, are there, are there other precautions around that that people need to be concerned about? Yeah, well, we, you know, based on um, state and CDC guidance, we really shut down everything that was elective. And I'm a breast cancer doc, so I can say, you know, a screening mammogram, the, the notion of a year exactly is somewhat arbitrary. So certainly it's okay to wait several months. There's no evidence that it's not. Um, but all of that is now open again. They're doing surgeries, even what were considered somewhat elective surgeries, um, mammogram screening, colonoscopy screening, really the full suite of healthcare. And if anything, we're getting worried as care providers about people um, having symptoms and not showing up when they need care. So I have to emphasize that. Not only is it safe to go back to the hospital, I really, I mean, I feel safer going in there than I do going to the supermarket. I feel pretty safe going to the supermarket. But if you have symptoms, it's really uh, in your best interest to get checked out, not just for cancer related things, but for all, anybody listening and for their family members, chest pains, breathing troubles that may have nothing to do with COVID. Um, there's still all of the other medical issues out there. And we've known for a long time that presenting late doesn't help you. So we do want people to seek care when they need it. Um, for patients with cancer, I think we're going to have a balance going forward. Virtual visits are great. As a, again, as a breast cancer doc, where at least half my time is managing side effects from endocrine therapy, hot flashes, fatigue, um, trouble sleeping, aches and pains, I really can do 99% of that in, in a video thing like this and help people. And I don't think the drive to the hospital or waiting in the waiting room is part of the benefit for them. So it's really a win-win. And I think we will, that's always been a lot of our care. We weren't set up to do it virtually before. We are now. So I think that will continue and honestly will benefit patients a lot. But for other things, particularly for people with advanced disease, but even a new diagnosis or for a cancer uh, survivor who's finished their initial phase of treatment and is now in follow-up and has all of the usual questions about what do I do now, it can be incredibly useful to have that be face-to-face. Um, and I think the clinicians, I can assure everyone, we want to be seeing you in that context. And I think my patients have appreciated it too. Do you find that you're getting a lot of questions uh, from your, your patients about their particular vulnerabilities and risks related to COVID and how they can stay safe? Tons, tons of questions. Um, and I guess there's two ways to answer that. I mean, the, the, the one question is, what is the risk to people with cancer as opposed to everything else we're reading in the media? Um, and I guess I, the, the, the best thing to say is that the data is still emerging. This is still relatively new. We don't have you know, comprehensive follow-up on lots of people with cancer. Some of the initial studies coming out of China just highlighted a history of cancer as one of the risks for more severe illness. But these were very small studies. Um, they, they weren't cohort studies or observational. It was sort of like something happened. Let's see what, you know, and a small sample of the people who were in the hospital had cancer. Um, we've now had much better studies. Um, one of the best was published in Lancet, one of our leading journals, looked at a thousand patients, mostly within the US, also some in Canada and Spain, and uh, who all had a history of cancer and documented COVID 
to just see what happened, what were the risks for more severe illness and not doing well. Um, I should emphasize still that everywhere, including the US, testing has been, it's getting better, but it's been largely restricted to the sickest people or people with bad symptoms. So whatever statistics we have, they don't fully reflect the reality because there's probably others with cancer who never had symptoms, who never got tested, or who had very mild symptoms, were worried about going in or didn't need to go in. So, so we know that's a fact, and I think that's reassuring. Um, but what we did find, as we've seen in other settings, is that age, other comorbidities outside of cancer, serious heart disease, serious lung disease, smoking, all were risk factors for doing worse. Um, having um, active or metastatic cancer was a risk factor compared to people who just had a history of cancer that was treated and they're disease free five years ago, um, which is not surprising, but is important. So for people with advanced disease, I think they do have to be more cautious. Um, there was a study coming out of France with more than a thousand patients with early stage breast cancer, um, follow, and, and a small subset of them had coronavirus. They didn't do any worse than anybody else, which, which stands to reason, but is reassuring to me um, as a clinician that I think for those people who are years out from their diagnosis, not on immunosuppressive therapy, I think their risk is probably like anybody else in the population. If you're on drugs that are causing your immune system to be weakened, there's a, there's a little bit of a higher risk. Now, getting back to what do you tell people to do, um, I tell everybody to be safe and I tell my colleagues and family to be safe. So I actually don't change my advice very much, whether you've got advanced cancer or you're on chemo or you're five years out from your breast cancer on nothing. Um, you know, in the home, just live your life, be healthy, all the things that you talked about for stress reduction and a healthy lifestyle. Um, I do encourage people to get out and get fresh air. I think that's healthy, mental health, physical health, but wear a mask. Um, I think if you're in one of the most vulnerable groups, you're over, you're over 65 plus advanced cancer plus other comorbidities, um, honestly, it's probably safe to go to the market with all the precautions. But if you can still, while we're dealing with this and learning more, if you can have other people do it for you and, and avoid indoor enclosed spaces for a prolonged period of time, I think that's better. I don't think you can avoid your medical care. You will do worse. So you have to go in for health care when you need it. But things that are elective, um, I, I, would, I would not be the first to be going out to restaurants again and things like that. Um, so that's what I'll say. Makes sense. Maybe as a last question before we open it up to uh, the broader group, uh, any sense of the progress we're making with respect to COVID treatments or vaccine? Yeah, I mean, and honestly, it's really exciting. I mean, I've been in oncology for basically 20 years now. We've made a ton of progress each year. In this disease, new disease, we had nothing um, as of March. And now we've got multiple promising drugs and tons more in development. So I think there's a lot of hope. Um, to rattle off some quick ones, I'll say remdesivir, um, this antiviral drug was shown to improve survival and cut the length that people are in the hospital by a third. So they're now ramping up production of that. And it, was, it seemed very safe, well tolerated. It's IV, so you're not gonna go get this at your drugstore. But, and we don't know whether it helps minimally symptomatic people, but for sicker people, that's been good. There was just a study that came out on Decadron, which many of our patients have probably been on. Um, 10 days of relatively low dose Decadron, um, again, improves survival. So this came out of uh, the UK recently. We still haven't seen the full paper, but if it, it's from a big group, it was a 3,000 person or maybe might have been 6,000 person randomized trial. If that data holds up, that will be a, a, a huge benefit. And again, it was on the sickest patients, preventing them from dying and getting them off ventilators faster. Um, there's many more drugs, I mean, honestly, there's many more drugs in development, lots of hope. And vaccines are now, this summer, as of like now, basically, are entering phase three trials. So this Moderna, a Cambridge company, is starting their phase three, enrolling 30,000 patients. They've got some preliminary data showing that the people who were exposed did get protective antibodies. There's great data in monkeys that protective antibodies will protect you from the virus. So there's a lot going on. And the last thing I'll say about this, um, there is a ton of information available from MGH. You do not need to be a, um, a clinician at MGH. You can just Google MGH COVID clinical trials or data. And as far as I can tell, because I didn't log into anything special, it's, there's a ton on the web. You can watch the grand rounds from our infectious disease experts, which are recorded. And for those who are interested, learn a ton about what we're doing right now at MGH. Um, 
and what's and what's coming. And, I, and last thing I'll say, because I'm proud of this, is our cancer center has really taken the lead. We've had the infrastructure for doing clinical trials more so than our colleagues in infectious disease or really any other part of the hospital. So um, some of my colleagues who focus on clinical trials are running the infectious disease trials, not just at MGH, but nationally and internationally. Um, so something we can all be proud of and they're, you know, they've made a lot of progress already. So that's great. You know, uh, I think the, uh, the other piece of some of this is that, you know, people have more or less contact in their families with, say, those who are on the front lines, the direct clinical workers and things like that. And, and the question now is, you know, we're three months, three and a half months ish into this. Is it, you know, is it, how safe is it for people to spend time with those family members? Um, you know, are there things, how, how, how much do you, yeah. you know, discuss the level of contact people have if they know that that other family member does have contact, like say in a clinical capacity with people who, are, who, who have maybe been diagnosed with COVID? It's, it's really tricky. I mean, unfortunately, I mean, the good thing is we know so much in just two to three months. The bad thing, I guess, is that there's still so much that's unknown. You know, really, there's not been a broad epidemiologic study of how is it spread for all these people? Cases are way down in Massachusetts. That's great. We had you know something like 100 the other day, maybe 200 many of the days now. That's that's 10 times lower than it was. But still, how are people getting it? We're not 100% sure. Um, so I think you have to be a little cautious with somebody with a high degree of exposure. Um, if somebody's got a family member who is you know working in a COVID ICU, we're doing everything we can on the healthcare end. To protect our, our colleagues and ourselves with appropriate masks and, um, uh, and gowns and all of that and we're keeping ourselves safe and I've not really heard of in the medical setting of we heard reports from China and Italy but in the US and particularly in Mass General in Boston I've not been hearing of colleagues getting it um, from their healthcare work um, as opposed to just out in the community um, but I think we just don't know so if you are uh, if you are high risk, and by that I'm meaning you know, you're over 70, you're on immunosuppressive therapy, you wanna do what you can. Uh, I wouldn't electively uh, be spending time there. And I think it's worth, you know, if you've got a partner who works in a frontline setting, they should be safe, but it's worth discussing what their degree of exposure is. Um, and if it comes to something more elective, not somebody who's in your immediate household, but getting together, I think from a distance with masks outside should be totally fine. I really can't imagine that if you're 10 feet away taking a walk together, that there's any particular risk of exposure, not that we know perfectly. But um, indoors, having a family member, having a, you know, a cousin who's a police officer or an ER physician over into your house, if you're vulnerable, it's probably a little premature to be doing that, I would say. Okay. I mean, to that point, my family and I are going to have my niece's fifth birthday. We're going to have to do this in an outdoor big backyard where people are going to be wearing masks and standing at least, you know, five, you know, six feet apart from each other. And, you know, people are going to bring their own food. You know, we're finding creative ways to make sure that, you know, we're protecting each other, but still it's, you know, it's my niece's fifth birthday. So we have to celebrate that. So, yeah. I, I think, right. And I think this, I mean, on several levels, that, like that's, that, these are why we're living life. These are the important things in life. You don't want to stop that. And I think there is a way to continue to do it but do it safely. So you might not normally have had it outside, but you'll have it outside. I mean, honestly, there, we don't know. I do want people who are going to the beaches and things this summer um, to be keeping their distance from people and be wearing masks when they're passing back and forth. When you get to your own little corner and you're 10 feet away from everybody or further, it's probably fine um, not to wear a mask the whole time, but I think we get a little cavalier if we don't do that. But, but I think if you're taking those precautions, and staying outside with the air circulating, um, any risk should be very low. Um, I also think there's a difference. I mean, everyone presumably on this call lives in Massachusetts, where as the cases fall and the active cases fall, just the risk of any random person having it with symptoms or not is very low. Um, when there are, and if we, if we get another spike and you start to see 1,000, 1,500 cases a day, the chance of a random encounter with somebody who has it, it becomes higher, and I think you need to then take uh, stricter precautions. Yes. 
in, as others are you know listening to us, if there are questions that are occurring to you as we're talking, please do type in questions. We welcome them. Some of the other questions we had received prior uh, when people registered were asking about uh, how to manage insomnia, also how to have the discipline to use mindfulness techniques, you know, the ones they've learned, how do they actually use them? Uh, I'll, I'll talk about those real briefly because actually the two of them can kind of go hand in hand. You know, I find whenever I'm trying to implement any new behavior, uh, say like a mindfulness practice, and just for those of you who don't know what that is, mindfulness is a form of meditation where a person is bringing all of their physical senses to pay attention to the present moment, just to notice what is happening in the here and now. Um, and trying to observe that present moment experience, uh, describe it in their mind's eye without judging the experience. So the way that I have actually incorporated this in my life and the discipline I had to do to do this was initially using an app. So I would listen to somebody and I would listen to that while I was walking to work. Um, and I have found that after a while, I, didn't, I no longer needed the app as sort of a, a guide. I could just do the exercise on my own. And the way I would practice it is so like, I could, you think about how you walk to work. I could walk to work and I can just be mindless and kind of thinking about all the meetings I have for the day and the different stressors. But rather than doing that, I would do a mindfulness walk where I would just be there in the moment and notice what do my feet feel like on the concrete? What does the wind feel like against my, my face? What do I smell in the ambient surrounding? What is the color of the house that I looked at, or the tree or the birds? Just using all my physical senses to pay attention to the present moment for that 20 minute walk. And so for me, it was linking it up to an activity that I do every day that really helped. So, so I do it when I walk. Sometimes I do it when I'm cleaning, like say I'm doing the dishes or something, I will do mindful washing and similarly, like what does this sort of stuff feel like on my hands uh, or the heat of the water, things like that just pay attention even for 10 minutes. So that's how I do it. I link it into activities, that really helps. One way to link it into an activity is for sleep. So when you think about difficulties with sleep, um, some people have trouble falling asleep and then others have a hard time staying asleep. For those who have trouble falling asleep, you really wanna think about your bedroom as a quiet sanctuary. We, we say the bedroom should only be for sleep and sex only. We don't want any other activity in the bedroom. So no TV viewing, really try to avoid reading your phone or iPads or other technology. Um, some people do like to read a book because it helps them fall asleep. And if that's the case where you read say for 20 minutes and fall asleep, I'm fine with it. However, if you're reading some sort of like, you know, action thriller kind of fiction, that's gonna keep you awake, then you wanna do that in another room. You really want the bedroom to be a place where you associate your experience as sleep. Um, so we don't wanna be awake in the bedroom for too long. If you find that you are, then you wanna actually get out of the bedroom and do something quiet and sedentary, maybe read or watch a program that's not too activating. And then when you find yourself nodding off, then go back to bed. <clears throat> but, <clears throat> excuse me, but if you do do that, Try not to sleep in in the morning, because when we sleep in, we're going to start what it's called sleep shift. We're going to start moving the time of when we sleep. We're going to start going to bed later and later and sleeping in later and later. So even though you may not have gotten enough sleep the night before, still get up at your normal time. And I can guarantee you, as long as you don't take any naps that next day, you will sleep better the next night. So, so that's one thing. In terms of falling asleep, though, this is where those mindfulness techniques can be really helpful. So some people will do just a body scan where they check in with all different parts of their body about how their forehead feels or their eyelids or their cheeks. And they'll just go from body part to body part from head to toe while taking slow, deep breaths. It's a nice mindfulness exercise right before they go to sleep. And that helps them fall asleep. Some people like to listen to, say, the two most common apps that people use for mindfulness are Headspace, uh, one word, Headspace, or Calm. That's the other one. Um, that have some free exercises. I know that, that after a while you have to pay for it, but they do have some free initial exercises and they'll listen to those to help them fall asleep or an imagery exercise. You know, everyone's a little bit different, but I think they can be a nice way of getting yourself ready to fall into that uh, sort of quiet space. The other thing for a lot of people, having white noise really helps, some sort of background white noise. I have a white noise maker that I use that's next to my bed and it really, really, just gets rid of all the other ambient noise that wakes up, wakes up people in the middle of the night. 
So I would highly recommend having some white noise machine or a fan or something like that in the background as well. People tend to sleep a lot better with those machines. Um, just a few tips on both of those uh, both of those fronts. That's incredibly useful. Um, I mean, it's honestly useful for, useful for me. Um, and I know from uh, we've surveyed our patients about 60, 70 percent have problems with insomnia. Also a good time to plug our lifestyle medicine webinar series for those who are interested. This has been Tuesday evenings. They've already done two of them. I think there's four more planned in the series. And I know that the upcoming one, I believe, next Tuesday is on sleep. Devin, can you comment on how people can find the link to that? Um, yes, um, it's on the Lifestyle Medicine website. So it's just massgeneral.org slash cancer slash lifestyle medicine. And I can send it out as well in the, in the box. That would be great. And I should say the two that were um, previously shown, we are getting those posted to the website. So if you missed them, you can still watch them. That's great. Uh, just to piggyback off of that. So I know earlier I mentioned that there are support services for emotional well-being in the cancer center. So people like myself uh, who are psychologists who provide psychotherapy. There are social workers who are assigned to each uh, clinic, like the breast oncology clinic, the thoracic oncology clinic. Uh, who are also available for support and counseling. Uh, we also have psychiatrists who can do a consultation for medications to help with anxiety and depression or other psychological difficulties. So, so I wanna make sure everyone is aware of that. Um, and you can always call the main number to get connected to our clinic and, and, and that's fine. Um, you can also just honestly talk to your oncologist and they can make the referral and it will come to me and I will make sure we get you assigned. So that if that's something that you would ever want to pursue, that's available, it's available now. And we can do that through virtual integrated Zoom like you've been having with your, with your other clinical providers. The other thing that's about to happen, and Devin, we probably want to let people know this uh, as well, um, is that in the next couple of weeks, we are starting up uh, virtual groups. These are mind-body resiliency groups. Uh, that are eight week sessions that you, you would go weekly for 90 minutes where you learn a bunch of the skills that I just mentioned in terms of coping with stress. Um, and these are really great groups that are specific for people who have been diagnosed and completed cancer treatment. Um, there have been some people who are still in ongoing treatment who have also participated. So, so if that is something that you may want, if you are a person who's still in ongoing treatment, um, you may also still be eligible, so I would say reach out to talk to them to see if that would work. Uh, so, so the way they sign up for those groups uh, is, is there's a website. It's just basically MGH. Let me get it correct. Sorry, I have it here. It is. While you're pulling it up, I'll say any clinician can now refer you also. So if you can't find it or don't remember, you can simply send a gateway message or call your 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 clinician, it seems it's an extra step, but they can, you know, with a few clicks of a button can refer you to the programs. Yeah, that's true. It's, it's MGH survivorship, all one word at partners.org. So if you are interested, you would just email MGH survivorship at partners.org. We, we got one question um, I, that I don't really have a great answer to. Um, people asked to comment on the blood type information that's coming out. And I think I've seen about what this individual has seen that people with a type O blood type have less risk of severe impact. This is always about your, your chance of being in the hospital or intubated or dying from the disease, type A more. Um, I, I don't yet know, and I'm not sure anybody knows whether this is just an association that's part of what we call a fishing expedition. You know, you study enough factors and enough people, you're gonna find things that may not otherwise be related, or if there's some real biological validity to it. Um, I don't think it's that, you know, you're, you're your home run safe if you're type O and your great danger if you're type A. Um, things are almost never like that. Um, so I'm not sure that there's much that you can do with this information. It's kind of like the data that men do are a little more likely to have severe than women. Um, you know, you can change your smoking habit. There's other things you can't change. Um, your blood type is one of them. So, uh, but I don't think you have to, I would not say as someone who I think, you know, scored an A minus on my blood type, I don't think you have to be particularly concerned about that. That's my take right now. Any other questions? Well, I think we're near the end of the hour. So I wanna thank Joe. Um, a lot of advice that will help me uh, with sleep and other things. I really appreciate it. Um, so Devin's gonna give you some, give you some, give you some.
continue on to for everyone um, to have our contact information and if you'd like to follow us on social media. But continue, Jeff. <laughs> I just wanted to say, also just say thank you very much uh, for your attention. Uh, we hope this webinar was helpful for you. Uh, we are here to help and support you in any way we can. So feel free to reach out if there's any more information we can provide or if you'd like to access um, our services. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.